welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around, we've got four movies from Umbrella Entertainment who have kindly sent me these ones to review. I've managed to see two of them so far. The other two I haven't, and I've just hit the wrong gesture, so the camera just went west. Let's fix that up. Hang on a sec. That's better, hopefully. And I've got to remember to not gesture in front of this camera. As I said, four movies. One's a South Korean crime film, which is really good. I've seen that already. One of them is an American crime film from 2001, which is very confronting. One of them's a French horror movie from the new French extremity, which is the genre of extreme horror films that movies like Martyrs came from. And the last one's an exploitation movie, which is, in a weird way, the most political movie that Brian Trenchard Smith ever directed. I'm going to do that one last, but I'll do the two that I haven't seen yet. And all of these are in really good editions, as is the case in Umbrella's um, releases in the last year or two. They've been really producing extraordinarily good releases of things. So I'm going to go with the American 2001 crime movie, Bully. Directed by Larry Clark, who did Kids and also Ken Park, which was a very controversial movie banned here in Australia. Umbrella has already released Kids on a premium edition just a few months ago, and now they've got Bully. This one is very confronting, and as you can see from the R rating on the J card, medium level violence, medium level sex scenes, and some sexual violence. So just be aware of that if you get this one. It's in a limited edition of uh, 2250. This is 2193 of that edition. As I said, J card. And on the back, special features on this one, full length behind the scenes documentary, music only audio track, a video essay by Earl Scott Jose, audio commentary by Jeremy Ritchie, notes on Bully with Jim Schultz, author of the novel that it was based on, and a trailer. Now, the movie's set in 1993 in Southern Florida. This one stars Brad Renfro as a kid called Marty, who's bullied by a guy called Bobby, played by Nick Stahl. And he and his friends are bullied and sexually bullied by this guy. And together they plot to murder him, and indeed they do. It's based on a real-life murder from the era. I don't know much about that murder, and it is, as I said, kind of confronting. This one says Region B, but I hear from a lot of people on the other side of the big drink that it will play overseas. I can't guarantee it, but anecdotally, a lot of people who get Umbrella releases tell me that they're not region locked, even though the card says that it is. So you've got that cover, original artwork there, which is quite good. And on the back, you've got that original artwork, which again is good. And underneath the slipcover, you have the different artwork of the um, group of youngsters in southern Florida there and more of the cover art there. This is one of those reversible covers which takes away the Australian censorship notification down there which I've already done. I just don't like the idea of having my covers with somebody else's idea of who should watch the film. Now this isn't for everybody, well no movies for everybody really unless it's some kind of watered down Steven Spielberg thing. But this is for people who can take this kind of movie in a sense, in the same way that the next movie I'm going to talk about is. But I will watch it. The movie also stars Bijou Phillips and Rachel Miner. Like all of Larry Clark's movies, it doesn't pull punches, and it is quite confronting, and a lot of people have trouble with it. But I'm glad that movies like this are released in quality editions, which also contextualize what's happening in the movie there is a premium edition of this which i didn't avail myself of if you are a fan of larry clark's films i'd recommend you get this one and again not for everybody but it's an honest dramatic film with a cast of good solid young actors taking on some very difficult material next one's a part of the new french extreme and it's a movie called eel in french and in english it's called them now don't think giant ants this is not that movie this is a french film from 2006 it's a french romanian horror film directed by david moreau and xavier palud and the title card at the beginning of the film says it's based on real events there it is there them 
it says you'll never feel safe at home again which gives you the idea this is definitely not a comedy there's a beautiful little tagline on the back of a, a review tagline saying lean mean and will leave your underpants anything but clean that's from ali gray at the shiznit.co.uk now this one's only available at the umbrella web store in this edition and it's a limited edition of 400. There's the back cover of the slip cover. And I'm going to read you the special features. Because my camera isn't cooperating particularly well with that. I had a feature length audio commentary with author Alexandra West. And Rue Morgue magazine editor Andrew Sabitsati. Hosts of the Faculty of Horror podcast. Safest Houses, a video essay on home invasion films by Alexandra Helen Nicholas. Which I'm going to watch because I really like her work. BFI at Home, Horror a la Francais panel with Anna Bogotskaya. Alexandra West and Dr. Lindsay Hallam, making of them featuring writers, directors, David Moreau and, Al and Xavier Paloud, and cast member Olivia Bonami and Michael Cohen, interview with the composer René Marc Blini, Clementine's Ordeal, police press conference, footage recovered from original location, and a new French extremity trailer reel. Now this again says that it's region B, but it possibly isn't. And I've got to be vague about that, and I do apologise that I'm being vague about that. Now, there's a bit more to this as well. There's a few other things. There are some lobby cards about that grainy black and white photography. So, definitely not French comedy. Now, I should tell you what it's actually about, which, is, which would be a good start. It's about Clementine, a young teacher who has recently moved from France to a remote but idyllic country house near Bucharest with her lover, Lucas, played by Michael Cohen. She's Clementine, played by Olivia Bonami. Their peaceful life turns to a fight for survival when they're attacked by mysterious assailants. And I have looked at the spoilers and these assailants, the nature of whom isn't revealed until the end of the film. Here's the inside slipcover. Nice piece of artwork. I really like that. I like the look of it. And again, you've got the line, you'll never feel safe at home again. Oh, well, because I have attack cats. And inside, you've got very bleak cover art there. And more of it there. And again, you've got the reversible cover with the Australian censorship classification there. This one's MA, which is below the R rating. You also get a reversible poster, which I love. I always like getting a reversible poster. Is that one and that one he said try to get it in frame there's also a book which I love there it is the story I'm not gonna show you that page because it is a spoiler I don't want to spoil this for you it talks about different home invasion horror films including Texas Chainsaw Massacre Playtime has a body count which sounds a lot like the playgrounds I was in at school when I was a kid a lot of essays there, which are, are great. I love having all of this stuff to contextualise the movies, particularly foreign language films, because there are sometimes nuances we miss if we're not part of the culture of the filmmakers and of the language being used in the film. It is subtitled, this one. So getting an extra bit of context doesn't hurt. And I'm going to give you context for the Australian exploitation movie that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video as well. But I will watch them, just like I watch Martyrs. Uh, and I feel that, and this is just an impression I'm getting, that like Martyrs, it's one of those films that I'm going to like the fact that I've seen and appreciate it for what it does. But it's a movie that I'm not going to soon watch again because the new French extremity films are inevitably, and all of the ones I've seen, have been good films. But they're not the kind of films that you go back to repeatedly. They're very confronting. They're very full-on. They're very ick in some ways, but also they're good horror films. Having said that, I'll let you know in a future video how I enjoyed them. Now, I've got to be in the right headspace for this kind of a horror movie, and at the moment I'm not. But them I want to see because I, when I touch on a genre like New French Extremity, I've got a tendency to want to see as much of it as I can. And it's really, really nice that Umbrella have released this one and made it available to me so I can expand my knowledge of this genre, even though it isn't my favourite genre and at times I find it very confronting. 
Let's get on to the two films I have actually seen. And I watched them yesterday and I enjoyed them both. Probably one of my new 17 or 20 favourite genres is South Korean crime movies. Because they tend to be quite extreme. South Korea does really lovely romantic supernatural TV series. Uh, which I love watching as well. There's a lot of those on Netflix. But their crime movies, things like I Saw the Devil. And in a very different way, A Tale of Two Sisters. Oh, this is editing me many hours later, realising that I didn't hit record when I did the synopsis for The Chasers, so I'm going to fix it now. It's directed by Na Hong Jin, and it was the first movie he made. Basically, the story is a guy, guy called Jung Ho, who is an ex-cop and now a pimp. He's played by Kim Yon Suk. So he's a pimp. He used to be a police detective. He's still friends with a lot of the police detectives he knows. He's in financial troubles because all the female sex workers he employs have wandered off. They've disappeared. He doesn't know why. One of them leaves after a bad encounter with a client. The rest of them he just doesn't know. One night he tells Mi Jin, his last remaining sex worker, to go and meet a client. Mi Jin's sick with the flu. Her seven-year-old daughter's looking after her. But she drags herself out of bed and goes and meets this client and then disappears. Jung Ho thinks that the client is selling these women on and is slave trading them. What he doesn't know is the guy's actually a serial killer and he's been killing people. And so he goes looking for this guy. He tries to get the help of his former squad of police, but they're in trouble because they've been on security duty for the mayor of Seoul and a protester threw a bucket full of shit on him while the cops weren't around. So they're in trouble and they're trying to avoid getting in deeper trouble. And so they, they don't help him when he needs it. Almost by accident, he encounters the guy who took Mijin and chases him. And this leads down a path of Jung Ho turning his life around in, in a really unusual way. He wants to get this guy. He wants to find out what happened to Mi Jin. He hopes that she's still alive. We know what happens to her because we see it in the movie. Jung Ho also meets um, Yun Ji, who is the seven-year-old daughter. And there's nobody to look after this kid, so he takes her with him while he searches for her mother and the serial killer who has her. Inevitably, the cops get involved and they actually arrest the guy. But they're not sure if he's actually a killer and whether he's responsible for a whole chain of murders that are occurring. He tells them he is, but he's an unreliable narrator in several directions. And Jung Ho is the only person who knows for sure that this guy is a killer. He tries to beat the information out of the guy, and that gets him in trouble, and the special prosecutor releases him from police custody because the trail of evidence is messed up by the fact that he's been beaten up by a pimp in a police lockup. So that then leads to the climax of the film and the epiphanies that Jung Ho has about his life and the way he's le leading it and who he wants to be in the future. It's a really hard crime film. The violence is brutal in it, in the same way but to a lesser degree than it is in I Found the Devil. It's, it's still pretty damn full on. But I found the devils at an extreme level, and this is kind of semi-extreme. The acting's fantastic in it. All of the characters are great. The female characters aren't just pretty things to be killed by a serial killer. Their lives and, their, and who they are is important to the story. The courage shown by a couple of women in this movie is quite extraordinary. The plot twists and the resolution to the plot is logical and real-worldish. And the film is just a really solid crime drama, which leaves in the dust most American movies of this type. It really is a good, solid piece of work. And a lot of it's set in the kind of lower class hills around Seoul, the kind of places where the poor people in Parasite lived, with the whiny streets and the alleyways, and the monsoonal rains, all of that stuff's in this film. The weather plays an important part in the film, almost to the extent that it does in, say, a Kurosawa movie. I really like this one, and you should check it out. Here's the inside cover, and I really like that cover art. The kind of duality of the two characters there is really a um, nice piece of work. And on the back, we have more of the characters there. Again, region B, but it may not be. I just simply don't know. Inside, you've got the reversible cover, of course. 
and the disc itself has that artwork on it again i really can't recommend this one highly enough it's just such a good solid little crime drama about which we don't hear a lot on in australia particularly i've got a few friends who are experts on south korean movies in general or asian cinema the buzz isn't loud on something like the chaser but if you are into um crime movies and particularly south korean dramas you're gonna really like this one that's rock solid the guy starts out as a pimp with an attitude and and not a nice person at all and has the reverse of that character arc and i really like that it's really well done and you should have it in your collection if you can possibly manage it last off we've got a brian trenchard smith film 1986 it's slightly cyberpunk it's dystopian it's science fictional it's based on a short story called crabs by peter carey the australian author whose work has been adapted into movies like oscar and lucinda and the 1985 movie bliss which is really underrated as well dead end driving brian trenchard smith starring ned manning and natalie mccurry and peter whitford an australian character actor i've got a lot of time for it can be considered a cyberpunk it can be considered punk it's definitely exploitation, but it's also got a political message which is very different from a lot of other brian trenchard smith films yeah you could argue that turkish shit's got a political message as well but dead end driving definitely has and they put out a wonderful chungus of a release here which you can only get from the umbrella web store and they sent it to me but they also sent me more send me a t-shirt with the skylar with the star driving on it and dead end driving on the back in fact i'm going to change into that t-shirt one two three it fits yes it fits happy with that i'm really like a release like this that has a 4xl t-shirt for big ass people like me to go with the umbrella hat and there's a lot of other extras here i'll, I'll go through the extras and i'll review them if you first off i've got a little bit of merch in a bag here and rustling cellophane is always a good asmr on the youtube channel keyring for the star driving haven't had a good keyring in an umbrella release since repo man in fact i'm using the skeleton keyring from the repo man one on my keychain at the moment but i might change it over for the star driving one a couple of stickers that you might want to stick on your car if you possibly can i lost it at the star driving matraville new south wales which is where it was filmed in the old star driving at matraville and a classic of the bumper sticker genre if this fan's rocking don't bother knocking you gotta like that i'm not sticking it on the car we've got a rav4 so i'm not doing that we've also got a car air freshener which i can't smell through the plastic and i'm not taken out of the plastic but if you're an into exploitation uh, yeah this is definitely something you can flex on and something which doesn't exist in any other format a cd of the original music composed by frank strangio or strangio sorry a whole bunch of original tracks for the movie mind-blowingly good addition to the thing and there are a lot of kind of synthy 1980s rock tracks on there let's have a look at the disc itself there's your cd there's your cd and i'll put my eye in the middle of it yeah nice stuff i mean, yeah, stick it in your car and just drive around pretending you're a hoon and you can look up hoon on wikipedia if you want to then we have big chunky box there's the cover there's the end part getting in was easy getting out was hell on wheels which sounds like a lot of relationships really and there is the back cover again this is a limited edition of 500 i've got number 52 so i've got a low end one and the collector's edition includes a 4k and a blu-ray completely uncut version previously only available on australian vhs scanned and restored from the, from the 35 millimeter interpositive an international cut 120 page hardback book including reprinted the original screenplay by peter smalley writing in the film by director Rob brian trenchard smith and producer damien para and archival materials custom designed slipcase eight replica lobby cards an a3 reversible poster and i love those limited edition numbered and i'm going to show you all of those things now i love the slip cover on this too there it is there really nice 1980s design there 
Well, on the back we've got the price of admission could be the rest of your life and an innovative use of bullhorns. Inside we've got the disc. Oddly enough, I didn't see any character that looked like that geezer in the movie. Looks a bit like David Argue. And there's the back cover. And again, I'm going to tell you what the movie's about. This one's all region because, of course, 4Ks are. There's your 4K. There's your Blu-ray. Double-sided poster. There's a party every day, a movie every night, and all the junk food you can eat. What more can a kid want except to get out? Sounds pretty good to me. And there is the other artwork that we've got there. Which I think I prefer to this one. This one's more accurate to the movie. Then we have the art cards. There's Natalie McCurry playing Carmen, the girlfriend of the protagonist Krabs. Nothing says Ozploitation like a car punching through the air. That, by the way, was the longest car jump at the time in an Australian film. Again, we got that. There's Crabs played by Ned Manning and Natalie McCurry when they finally figure out what's going on. There they are again. A exploding police car. Again, a highlight of a lot of Australian exploitation films. There's one of the punk cars travelling the streets of post-apocalyptic Australia. And I like this one. Very punk. And she's got a car license plate as a kind of cummerbund. And then we've got the hardcover book. Nice cover on it. On the back you've got part of the wall. Script. And you could do worse than getting this if you're interested in script writing yourself. Just to figure out the format and the way things are communicated in a script. Got a little bit of um, de art design there. And again, a lot of information. Part of it by Brian Trenchard Smith. Some of it not. A good read there to contextualise the movie, which I'm going to tell you about after I put all this stuff away. Now, I watched the 4K last night, and it looks fantastic. I've never seen the movie look so good, because I've only ever previously seen it on VHS. And so seeing it in 4K just blew me away, and, and the cinematography is just terrific, as well as Brian Trenchard Smith's characteristic action stuff. But I went a little further than that this time because I actually read the short stories based on Crabs written by Peter Carey. And right up towards, right at the end, when it gets a little surrealistic and metaphysical, the movie pretty much follows the story, which is a little bit unusual. There is that maxim that movies are best made from short stories and series are best made from novels because you cut so much out of a novel to make a movie out of it. But a short story is the right amount of information for a movie. Now, set in the near future of the time, an alternate universe, you could say, for a modern era, the economy has collapsed and the crime is swamping the inner cities. There are tow trucks go around picking up people who have been in car accidents and they bribe the cops and take away the cars and chop them up. But they're also fighting against gangs of youths called car boys who will grab any car they can get and strip it for parts and they're quite violent they're nasty and they're very very punk the unemployment rate's gone skyrocketing and young people are finding it very hard to make a living which is in some ways parallel with the rental crisis we have here in australia at the moment so there's a young guy played by ned batting called jimmy rossini his nickname's crabs who is into fitness he wants to be fit he wants to be able to become a tow truck driver just like his brother, who is much bigger and bulkier and runs a tow truck company. So he steals his brother's vintage Chevy and takes it to the drive-in one night with his girlfriend, Carmen. He tells the owner of the drive-in, played by Peter Whitford, a guy called Thompson, that they're unemployed so he can get a discount on it. So Krabs and Carmen are in the drive-in. They're watching what are basically clips from Brian Trenchard Smith films particularly the man from Hong Kong, Turkey Shoot, and there's one other I've forgotten. But they're the movies that are showing at the drive-in all through the movie. I suppose it's cheaper to use your own films or that sort of thing. So Krabs and Carmen are doing the beast with two backs when the car suddenly lurches and they find out that somebody has stolen two of the wheels off the car. 
Hank Krabs gets out with a large wrench in his hand and finds out it's the cops that have stolen them. And that they're trapped in this drive-in, along with a whole bunch of other people. There are food vouchers, which they use in the concession stand at the drive-in, and they can only get unhealthy food. They can't get car parts. There are people who have made a community in this drive-in. Yeah, they play cricket, they have games, they play 2-Up, which is an Australian gambling game, which I'm not going to explain to you, look it up. And the women do each other's hair and talk to each other, and they tell each other that you can get contraceptive pills from the lady who runs the concession stand in the driving because you don't want to have a kid in this place. But Krabs is a, a determined guy. He wants to get out. He is determined to get out. He doesn't want to keep being there. He wants to go and live life on his own terms. And so he stays fit, he tries not to eat the unhealthiest food in the concession stands, and he doesn't join any of the stupid gangs of young men who pretty much run the place. Now, as time goes on, things start to change in the drive-in. Krebs has an antagonistic relationship to Thompson, who initially tries to recruit him to be his assistant to keep things going in the drive-in. As time goes on, the authorities bring in truckloads of Asian refugees and they set up their own camp and start their own community on one part of the drive-in and so all the white Australians who are already there start getting really racist about these people who've come into their territory and don't live like them and so there's a, an antagonism between them as Krabs is trying to find a way up he's trying to find tires for the car He's trying to keep the engine in tune. He's trying to do all this kind of stuff. He's quite resourceful and quite and cunning. But the authorities work against him in various ways. Now, here's the thing about this movie that a lot of people won't get. The movie is an analogy for Australia. The driving itself is an analogy for Australia. The guy running it is the kind of blokey, um, she'll be right, here, have a beer, mate. Everything will be okay kind of guy, even though he is secretly an arm of the repressive society around them. The young people are disenfranchised. They're giving bread and circuses, basically, to keep them pacified. And then when there is Asian immigration, the racism starts, which parallels the 2006 Cronulla riots, where a whole bunch of white Australians beat up a whole bunch of non-white Australians because of a media beat up by commercial radio stations, including people like Alan Jones on 2GB where basically they went to the beach of Cronulla on Australia Day and terrorised people who weren't white. That happened actually in Australia and mainstream media was a part of that. This, is, this movie happened well before that. But that kind of racist rhetoric and that keep the Asians out kind of thing has been part of Australian history from the 19th century onwards. And so there were really strong parallels in this movie politically between the way Australia was in 1986, just before the bicentennial celebrations in 1988, celebrating 200 years of colonisation. And in fact, there's a card at the start of the film which says there were enormous riots against the bicentennial in 1988. This movie, of course, was made in 1986, so they were extrapolating. The reverse happened. A couple hundred thousand people protested in Sydney against the bicentennial celebrations indigenous mob from all over australia came to sydney to protest it and i was there i was part of the protests i walked with the mob from central station all the way up to hyde park where there were the protests and the talks and the discussions and the speeches and it was one of the most wonderful group experiences of my life Nobody was arrested at that protest. Not one person was arrested. Dozens of people were arrested around the harbour who were watching all of the celebrations. Lots of drunken idiots were there and um, at the celebrations were acting up and acting like the young people acted in the dead-end drive-in. The protest itself was dry. I was listening to the radio Redfern, which is the indigenous radio station in Sydney at the time, for weeks before the protests. And one of the things people were emphasising was, don't get on the grog, don't get drunk. We want this to be a, a serious, sober and peaceful demonstration. And it was. So that time in Australian history is something that's deeply part of me. And having it mentioned in an Australian exploitation movie just blew my mind when I watched it this time. It's 
um, an interesting film. And like the original short story, it is a metaphor for all the worst aspects of late 20th century Australia. And that makes it a much more powerful movie than many exploitation films. So I'm, I'm really glad that Umbrella have put this out. It was a movie that I underestimated until I watched it again this time and read the short story. It's a solid piece of science fiction apart from anything else. Proto cyberpunk. It's very punk as well. The soundtrack is very much an Australian rock and roll soundtrack with bands like Hunters and Collectors doing some of the music for it. And the production design is fantastic. The graffiti, the neon, the clothing and their hairstyles and the makeup. All of it is really 80s cyberpunk in so many ways. It's a wonderful piece of work. I've got a t-shirt and a keychain as well, which is, you know, extra points. Thank you, Umbrella. And I actually talked to, I think it was Ben at Umbrella, who said, listen, you need to get the um, release we're doing with the t-shirt. We've got four XL t-shirts. And I went, okay, yep, I'll definitely do that. And the extras are great. The stickers... If I had the money, I'd probably buy a van just so I could stick this sticker on it. Dead End Driving's an underestimated and sometimes marginalised piece of exploitation. And I think it gets extra points and extra respect because it is unashamedly and openly political. And I love it for that. And it's going up the list of exploitation movies that I love because of that. Ned Meng, who um, went on to become a theatrical director in later years is good as Krabs. He, even though he's playing a character 10 years younger than him, he's really good at it. Natalie McCurry is really good as Carmen, and she has her own arc, which is much darker and nastier than Krabs is. Peter Whitford, who's still around, but he isn't acting at the moment, he's in his 80s, is really good as Thompson. A lot of the other actors are, are quite good as well, with the possible exception of Wilbur Wilde, who overplays his character to the point that it's just cringy. If you haven't seen Dead End Driving, worth checking out, worth picking up from Umbrella Entertainment's web store. You can get this edition or you can get a couple of other editions they have with this. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, hit make a comment, hit the notification bell so you know when I'm putting out videos. Got Science Fiction Saturday coming up. Got a whole bunch of interesting stuff coming out next week, including a movie which has two gimmicks in it. Not just one that William Castle did, but two separate gimmicks in it, which I love and which I knew nothing about. And I've just hit the thing again. It's just got the gestures happening again, which it's annoying. You can also support the channel by becoming a channel member or by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. So until Saturday when I'm doing the science fiction and next week when I'm doing some really weird and unusual and obscure and hidden gemmy kind of movies. Watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some South Korean crime films and French horror movies and American dramas and Australian exploitation films and I'll catch you next time.